Welcome to Ithaca Politics, a series of shows that looks at the political life of Ithaca, New York. Our guests on this episode are the candidates for the third ward, Pierre St. Perez and Pat Sewell. Now, you both, in my opinion, have kept pretty low profiles as candidates. So um, what should we know about you that would convince people from the third ward to vote for you? So uh, Pat, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I've lived on uh, South Hill. That's where I live. I've lived on South Hill for 15 years. I've been very active in the community in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm really interested in what's going on in Ithaca and in working with the people of our ward to make sure that the things that folks are interested in are represented both on city council and for the ward. I've got a background in um, teaching. I teach at TC3. I work at Green Star. And I also recently started working at the Downtown Ithaca Alliance on the Commons. So I have a good sense of what's going on in the community and what people are interested in. Um, so what do you think people are interested in? What are you going to be focusing on, do you think? So the, the three things that I've been focusing on or that I, I think are important, one for, I see it both in terms of the ward and also in terms of the city. Um, for the ward, the, um, making sure that we retain the character of the neighborhoods by uh, limiting student housing as it comes in. Um, try, one of the ideas that's come up is the idea of um, owner-occupied um, uh, layovers in zoning to try to keep the number of um, multi-unit residences coming in um, from student housing. That's for the ward. For the city, the thing that um, I'm interested in is the, the Ithaca Green New Deal. That's pretty important to me. Um, and also making sure that our public workers are getting back to work because a lot of the city's projects are being um, the city hasn't been able to keep up with its maintenance needs um, in safety and in um, maintenance and all sorts of stuff. Okay, I'll turn it over to you, Pierre. Well, I grew up here in Ithaca. This is my home. This is where I was born. My first ever bed I slept in was right in the third ward. Um, I feel a deep connection to Ithaca and to the third ward. Um, and you know, I've really been engaged in my time in Ithaca. I went to LACS, I got very involved there during that time. I was a student representative to the Board of Education. I was apprenticed to Common Council when I worked closely with current Third Ward representative Rob Gearhart. Um, I really view him as a mentor. Um, I've also worked closely with Cynthia Brock in the past, uh, who currently represents Pat and myself, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the current setup, working on projects, doing research, she's... I want to continue the legacy of people who've changed my life and taught me so much about how to serve a community. So the third ward has a high density of long-term residents and students. And Pat, you've uh, alluded to this, but as a representative in the ward, how are you going to maintain uh, neighborhood harmony? Uh, so if you'd like to start. Absolutely, I would. I am both. I'm both a local and a student. I've experienced Ithaca from both of those sides. And those are really different experiences. The student experience of Ithaca and the, the local experience of Ithaca, it's almost like the center of gravity is in a different place. And that's not a fundamentally bad thing. And I think that both our student and local communities could benefit greatly from interacting. I also think it's important that the student community doesn't overrun our local communities that are wonderful and valuable and really necessary for that student community to thrive. Hmm. Uh, do you see a representative being somewhat of a mediator around conflicts that may be happening? I absolutely do. And again, I think being able to speak as both 
someone who you know, has the student experience, is currently a student at Cornell, and can also speak, I'm, I'm studying law, um, and can also speak as someone who, you know, knows people from church, knows people from high school, has been in school with people's kids. I think having both of that will allow for, will allow me to mediate more effectively and to try to bring the community together. And I do really think that students and long-term residents have a lot to gain from each other. Pat, do you have any thoughts on this issue? Sure. Uh, we, uh, and on South Hill, so I've been on South Hill, I'm learning Bill Sherman, um, and our, our um, the new redistricting is actually, I think, a really good uh, fit for both sides because we have pressure from IC students, and Bell Sherman has pressure from Cornell students, and there's a lot of interaction between the both, so it, it, it fits really well. Um, on South Hill, in the past, we've tried um, a, um, I can't think of the, the proper name, but it, like a civic community engagement thing. Um, there were some active folks who got together, and every fall met with, tried to meet up with students and set up a, a positive tone to do that. Um, and there's some, some signs up saying, hey, you know, we, we like you here, um, but we also like the neighborhood being relatively low key. Um, we have a lot of kids in the area, that sort of thing. And so that's an, that's an interesting method. I like it. It kind of worked, it kind, kind of didn't. One of the difficulties we run into is that the population turns over pretty frequently. And so you can develop good relationships, and, but they're not gonna last forever. So it's a, it's a long-term process, and one that's been started in the past, and I'd definitely be interested in restarting it again, and possibly something in the Bell Sherman area, and I'm not sure if they do that currently. Um, but it has some upsides to it, uh, because some students are fantastic, some students are not, just like all you know <laughs> all people who live in areas you get your you get your mix um, but we definitely would like uh, harmony in our relationship so yeah mm -hmm. when I lived on Crescent Place and you know there were issues that had come up with students I often wondered why there wasn't more rapport with Ithaca College in terms of having the college take more of a role in what's been happening in the neighborhoods. We do have a relation well in the past we've tried to have a relationship with the college to contact uh, them directly to speak to issues with the students that are living off campus. Uh, we've worked with the police department as well. Um, I mean, there's a couple different leverage points, but that's a, that's a good one. I think they may have not as much leverage as we would like, um, or just maybe not exercised as much, um, depending. But that is definitely uh, a route to do. You want to have a relationship with the school because that is an entity that's going to be around for a while. Yeah. Just adding on to that, I mean, I think an amount of, I assume we're going to get into the city's relationship with Cornell later, so I'm not going to get into that <laughs> now, but I think there's a good part where, right, Ithaca College doesn't have the same kinds of, we can't exert the same kinds of pressures, which albeit are very limited on Cornell, like, sorry, on Ithaca College that we can exert on Cornell since IC just isn't in the city of Ithaca. And I think that municipal line between the town and the city, right, right where Ithaca College starts, makes it really hard for us to get stuff done when trying to work with Ithaca College. I mean, they're not in the city. Mm. That's a really good point. Let's uh, look a little bit at uh, the idea of rezoning. A mm -hmm. uh, number of candidates brought up that they would like to see rezoning to increase density in the neighborhoods. So I'm wondering about South Hill and the Bell Sherman. Do you see more density as a good thing? And how would this necessarily reflect um, the neighborhood character? You know, I think one of the core aspects of Ithaca is being welcoming. We are a welcoming community that will take people in and we will care for people and we will be there for each other. And when we're talking about density, I think one way of framing it is, you know what? That's more neighbors, that's more friends. That isn't to say that we need to single-handedly, single-mindedly pursue density. What we need to do is think about how to alleviate our housing crisis, and it is a crisis, uh, bringing 
more housing into our communities is part of that solution. But it would be a tragedy, a tragedy, if in our quest to solve a crisis facing our communities, we destroy them. Right? We can't, we can't pursue density as if it is the goal. It's one of the tools in our arsenal to deal with a crisis. What is your thought about density, particularly in the South Hill neighborhood? I don't know so much about um, Bell Sherman, but I know South Hill is pretty dense as it is. It is pretty dense as it is. Um, and frankly, I like the way the neighborhoods are. <laughs> I do like single family homes because I think those bring something really important to the character of the areas. Um, I especially like um, the ability of single families, you know, bringing families in. Uh, one of the things that is happening on South Hill is the Morse Chain Development Project. And I know the timeline on that is long, but that would definitely uh, create a lot more living, well, doing that particular thing, density uh, in that area once that comes online. Um, and that's very attractive to me. I really like the idea of the South Hill area developing that fashion. I really like the neighborhoods staying pretty similar to how they are. Hmm. Well, I mean, I see the apartment complexes kind of creeping their way into South Hill. Right. And, and uh, Bell Sherman. And Bell Sherman. And Bell Sherman. Sherman they, yeah. they, they are creeping. So right. where would your stand be as a representative? Are you uh, uh, agreeable to having more apartment complexes, or would you try to put more of a hold on it? <laughs> I mean, I'm, yes, I'm very clear on that. No, I would not like to see them coming. I mean, it, it depends on where we're looking at, because it some, does seem like there are some areas um, where they, there's already a car, apartment complexes that have taken you know, hold of a particular street. But we have certain areas in the neighborhood which we really should try to keep a single family, and I feel very strongly about that. I agree with Pat on this one. Um, I don't think, I think it's a mistake to conceptualize density as, okay, we're gonna bulldoze and build some apartments. Uh, creating density can be as simple as uh, creating systems that allow people to rent out, making, making it possible for someone to have instead of one, one person renting by your zoning laws, two or three. Uh, small rental systems can substantially, I mean, we're talking about doubling or tripling number of people per property without significantly impacting the community. And we're also not talking about forcing anyone into anything. You mentioned the uh, Southworks project. Yeah formerly known as Chainworks. Sorry, so, yes, yeah, Southworks, <laughs> right. Um, Wait, we renamed it? it yeah, it was renamed, yes. <laughs> Apparently, yes. Uh, it's nicer tone, yeah. <laughs> they didn't seem to want to be reminded of the industrial <laughs> yeah, Yes, yes, yeah. right. Uh, but um, Pierre, are you favorable of the, are you in favor of the scale? It's a very big project, and how do you think it's going to affect the South Hill neighborhood in the long term? It's a very big project. It's also a very big factory well, industrial center that we've had sitting there. It's present. It's not like it's not there if we don't use it for something. I'm fully in favor of taking that space. And I actually really appreciate that the process was a joint process between the city and the town of Ithaca mm -hmm. in order to create the plan, decide what to do with the space. I mean, it's a process that was going on when I was in middle school. Right, this has been a long-term project. People have poured so much time and energy into deciding the best way that that space can serve the community. I'm absolutely in favor of the conclusions that were reached and I hope that the project will be able to, I, don't, I hope to one day see it completed. It, I, my understanding is that it, there's not much movement on it right now. But apparently a, a large venture capital organization has infused a lot of money yeah. to get this thing jump started. And a lot of people are a little concerned, you know, outside venture capitalists investing in Ithaca. Um, does that sort of sit okay with you? Is it worth it to see the uh, Southworks project move ahead? Ithaca has become a target zone for outside investment and development. And that's part of the reason why our property values keep on being pushed higher and higher and higher and why it's becoming harder and harder and harder to live here. I don't like that fact, but if they're going to pitch in to put more housing in place and 
develop an area that, again, isn't in use in a way that might help us. I, I don't think that it's worth torpedoing that in order to take some stand, right? We have immediate crises that we need to solve. We, we don't have a method of saying, no, all external investment, we need to keep it out. If we did, maybe we could ask that question. We don't have that tool. I don't see what the difficulty is uh, about where the funding's coming from. It, it, what I would be more concerned about is what are the rules and regulations surrounding the project and what's going to happen to the project. Who funds it is really not, I, I don't think that's as much of an issue. Um, and I think about that, for example, with the, the Green New Deal projects, a lot of that came from actually Wall Street funding for um, Ithaca, and it's because they have the money for it. And if they want to spend the money and possibly lose it, I, that's fine with me. <laughs> I mean, it depends on sort of the rules and regulations surrounding it. But this, this project is a fantastic opportunity for the South Hill to um, develop a little bit, to bring in some economic activity, to uh, bring in some uh, new things to South Hill, South Hill, like new businesses, things like that, certainly more residential in that area. And along, uh, along those lines, um, Morse Chain was a huge polluter and left a lot of TCE in the ground. Uh, because this is now going to be a residential facility, they have much higher standards for cleanup. And so this is, uh, we've got, if it's whoever, an outside venture capitalist paying to clean up uh, this area. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure what the, yes. <laughs> okay. I'd like to know from the both of you, I have two questions. Do you favor putting negotiations with Cornell on hold until, until a new city council and a new mayor is seated in 2024? And the second part of the question is, should council be expecting more than the $4 million that are now on the table? Um, Pierre? The city is in and of itself an entity, right? We should continue to negotiate. Like this, we, the city as an organization represents us, the people of the city, and has to continue to negotiate. I, I don't think negotiations should stop just to wait until one of us is sitting in one of those chairs, however exciting that would be. Um, however, council can and should expect more than the deal that Cornell has offered. And that's among other reasons because it's in Cornell's interest. Cornell relies on Ithaca. Ithaca relies on Cornell. We exist in a symbiotic relationship and somewhere in the Cornell administration, someone has forgotten this. But the city, going through city projects sometimes feels like doing triage. You know, we have a leaky roof, we have a building falling down, we, we, gotta, we gotta patch up the building just enough so that city staff can keep working in it, so that the sewer system can keep running, but we can't afford to actually fix it. We do patch jobs on our roads, we fill in the potholes, but we don't fix the underlying problems. And sometimes we don't even fill in the potholes. This city is doing triage and a good deal with Cornell a deal that was fair with Cornell would allow us to go from doing triage to investing in, in building longer term, more sustainable and safer infrastructure for everyone in Ithaca. That includes students. One of the, pro one of the little tests I've been using in my head for is this a good deal with Cornell, like is it a fair deal with Cornell, is will we ever be able to repair Stewart Avenue? <laughs> Like, ever. <laughs> and under the $4 million deal, we won't. It's, it will remain outside <laughs> of the price range for what the city infrastructure budget can absorb. Okay. I mean, Pat, this feels a little bit like a game of poker. <laughs> it's really hard to know, you know, what can be the outcome. Uh, just getting to the second part of the question, is it a safe bet to take what's been offered or should they hold out longer? So, 
Yeah, so this is hard. And part of what's hard, I just learned this recently. I did not realize this. Um, because I've done a lot of um, contracts and negotiations. I'm, the, I'm a union president, so we do memorandums of agreement all the time, or, or MOAs or MOUs. But in this particular MOU, apparently, um, if it is not re-signed, Cornell doesn't pay anything. It completely ends, which is just totally bonkers to me. I was not. I just assumed that the current contract would stay in place and continue on, and it doesn't. And if that's the case, um, that's kind of scary. Um, I mean, that's it's a significant uh, portion of our budget. Um, it's not. It's not uh, all of it, but it's significant, and. Um, and I think that's a real concern that the current Common Council one would want to take seriously. Um, how disruptive would it would it be to not, you know, receive funding next year? I, I actually I'm not entirely sure. I would sort of try to get some information on that before I decided that. But that's that's a real question. And would Cornell be willing to just cut off all funding? That I don't know either. Um, at the last council meeting where uh, Cornell presented, they indicated that they would be willing to cut all funding, and that was the, their plan if uh, the city didn't accede to that deal. Thank you. Um, and, I mean, the results of, we'd be looking at a one and a half million dollar shortfall in the city budget. Yeah. It, would, it would be challenging for all of us in the city. Yeah. Should, should they sign it? I mean, I would not be angry with them if they did, uh, because it seems like it may be the responsible thing to do. I will say this is this makes a lot of people really mad at Cornell for unnecessary reasons, um, because a lot of the provisions in the MOU seem deeply unfair. One of them being that it's a 21 year contract. One of them being the provision that city officials cannot lobby the state or federal government um, to change tax laws, which is crazy to me. Um, the yeah, it, and and uh, even the amount, um, it's it's very frustrating, um, and I I'm afraid they're going to burn themselves because people are going to get so upset. There may be some greater legislation surrounding this. Uh, the The New York Times just today had an article uh, talking about Columbia and NYU, um, who also are really squeezing the tax base of New York City, and they're they may have taken too much. I mean, anyways. <laughs> Recently, council passed a resolution for sanctioning encampments in the jungle mm -hmm. that would allow more supports for the people living there, but also without the language of enforcement, which mm -hmm. has been controversial. I pose this scenario to other candidates, so I'd like you both to respond. So we have a person who's been sleeping in the um, Seneca Street bus shelter for a few nights. He's not harming anybody, but people have called the police to complain. Mm -hmm. uh, outreach workers have approached the person and tried to nudge him towards the jungle, which is sanctioned as an encampment. But he said, no, no way. I had a bad experience with the jungle. Sure. And he's not allowed in um, the, emergency, the emergency shelter system. So what should really happen with this person? I'd like to get both of your opinions. Uh, one background question. You said this person's not, is this a real scenario you're talking about or is this hypothetical? Uh, well, there are people are sleeping in the Seneca no, Street shelter, but it, it's a bit of a hypothetical okay. because um, only the sanctioning be of the encampments haven't quite happened yet. Yeah, yeah. only I ask because I spend so much time downtown that I know a lot of the people who uh, sort of occupy this part okay. of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you're talking about anyone in particular. Um, but uh, the one question, the first question would be, why are they not allowed into the shelter? And I assume, do you know why? Or if it's a hypothetical, you're It's just... a hypothetical, okay. but so there presumably, are people that aren't allowed in yeah, the Yeah, I mean, there are people system. not allowed in the shelter. Yeah. They have to go through DSS processing in order to get into the shelter. And there could be various reasons why they don't want to do that. Um, the difficult thing I run into, um, so like, if the question is, should we do nothing or should we do something? The Which, question is, what is your personal response to this type of a situation? About someone sleeping in a public space. Right. Uh, I, I get frustrated with it. <laughs> uh, 
And I get frustrated because I see public spaces as commons, uh, places for everyone to be. And I think when people end up staying in them for long periods of time and setting up space, they are turning it into a sort of private area for themselves, which sounds weird, but it, it does end up feeling that way. Um, if someone, it, it, you know, stays in, in a particular area for long extended periods of time, they're the only ones who can use it. Um, and I, yeah, that, that just prevents other people from using the space. Um, I don't know that this guy's preventing other people from using the space. I don't know if they're doing drugs there or, or you know, it, it's a hypothetical, so we don't know anything about them. Well, um, my observation is the person just sleeps there. Oh, they and sleep and then they leave. Right. Yeah, I mean, in that case, I don't see any particular, in fact, I don't, no, I don't see any particular problem with that because no one's using it at the time and it's not, not being used. And no concern for any extraordinary police enforcement of sleeping in a public space? No, I think in a time when people aren't using it, it's kind of, I, I would not be concerned about that. But if you're talking about in the middle of the day and it's a high traffic area and, and people are trying to catch the bus. I mean, bus, it's both cases. Yeah. Well, it, it becomes more problematic when people are trying to use it for yeah. the purposes it's designed. Um, yeah, that, that's where I start seeing a little more difficulty. Okay. Um, Do you feel it should go so far as to have police enforcement to move this person along? Well, I, it would depend on how the person responds. I, if you've got a situation, I mean, this, so this happens on the commons. We have someone who regularly just sleeps in the middle of the commons, just lays down, <laughs> lays down and brings a pillow and just lays down in the middle of the commons. Um, and, um, and it, and really bugs people. Um, it's right next to the playground, so there's some concern about that. They're usually um, under some sort of, you know, intoxicating thing. And so the first role is to call social workers uh, or outreach workers to, to try to get them to move. And then the second role is to ask the police to do it. And what's happened in the past is the person just gets up and moves. But mm -hmm. should they be handcuffed? And I mean, happily, that's, I haven't seen that happen. Um, but it, it's a different question than should they be able to set up a camp, right? Build a tent. Since can someone put a tent on the commons? I, no, I don't think so. I think that creating a hypothetical like this one takes us away from the deeply individual nature of this issue, right? Every person who is living on the street or living in the jungle has a story. They have their connections. They have outreach workers who they interact with, community members they interact with, and police officers mostly, most of them who they interact with and who they have relationships with. Council has to have a policy, right? The way our system of governance works, the Common Council has to release a big impersonal policy saying, this is our plan. But it's meant to be enforced, if we're going to use that word, at a very individualized level by people who understand the individual situation of that person sleeping in the garage. Right? We, we have to act in a way that matches our values as a city, of our values as a community. I think we can all agree that those values don't endorse locking someone in jail over sleeping in the Seneca Street garage. That doesn't mean that it's something that we want to be happening either. And there's a fine line there, which I think really needs to be treaded by people on the ground, by the people who talk, who form connections, and find how best to help each other. Okay. Uh, you did mention the commons, mm -hmm. and uh, part of what Ithaca Politics does is go out to the community and talk with individuals. And our first place was the commons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was going to be kind of a light conversation with people, <laughs> but I was really uh, surprised at no. the venomous feeling that a lot of people had about the crime that's happening yep. on the commons. And to me, there was a sense of despair mm -hmm. that seemed to have settled in, which is unusual because I've been around a long time and I've never really thought of the commons as being a despairing place. 
So I'd like to ask you both, if you were elected, uh, what would be the steps that you could take to improve the commons, of course, but also the public spaces that we have for people to feel that it's the safe and uh, yeah. you know, a reasonably nice place to go to again? I'm super excited to answer this. So, <laughs> you go for it. Go for it. I'll uh, let well, you. You know, the first thing is, when's the last time you are on the commons, besides interviewing people? Before that, when was the last time you were on there? Well, I go through quite a bit. Oh, I you do? ride okay. a bicycle, so I kind of cut through a lot. So it's probably the day before yesterday. Oh, okay. I yeah. only ask because I, when I talk to people about the commons, they say, man, I was down on the commons recently. It's just kind of depressing. And it's a common, in, uh, it's a common response. So I work, there's a little red kiosk on the commons, and mm -hmm. I hand out literature about Ithaca for Downtown Ithaca Alliance. So I, I, and I do it on Sundays and Mondays, so I'm there quite a bit. And that's why I'm saying I actually have a lot of experience with the people on the commons. And um, so I'm very familiar, with, <laughs> very familiar with this. And um, a lot of issues that we're seeing on the commons are the general taboo, general things that wouldn't have happened previously that were either taboo or um, not enforced or um, restricted by police presence or something like that are not, no longer being enforced. So people are riding their bikes on the commons. Uh, very quickly. Um, there also, basically, it's a, there's open air drug markets, there's open um, container, I mean, just blatantly open container. There's um, people who set up shop on sidewalks for hours and hours and hours at the time, which is, or on benches, which is fine. Um, but there's a lot of drug use that's happening and it's just very open. And then, so like the other week, I broke up a fight because these two guys so are- So what are the answers? Sorry, I'm getting, yeah, yeah thank please. you. What, what, <laughs> As a council person, what would the answer be? <laughs> Two answers. <coughs> One, we need to make sure that we um, have a good relationship with the county to increase the amount of mental health workers that we can bring out there, or social workers to do that, people that you can have on call. We've got, I've got some folks on my, on my mobile to call, but they're, they've got limited hours and they're, they've got limited resources, and they're the first people I want in a lot of situations. Um, because the police are useful for some things, but in, in many interactions, it can lead to escalation. So let's get those folks. They're not currently funded. They're not as funded as they need to be. We need to beef that up. The other is um, reinstating the, or bringing the police force back to its previous levels because there have not been enough police able to, you know, I call them for problems on the commons and they've been unable to respond in a meaningful time period. So I'll, I get, as you can tell, I can go on, but that's, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Pierre, do you have thoughts about what's happening on the commons and other public spaces around Ithaca? I do. Um, the commons has, I think, been particularly hard hit by COVID in terms of community and i think this applies to a lot of our spaces but it's most obvious with the commons which we i think most of us remember as this vibrant living space and it feels less so now a lot of that i think has to do with just businesses and community around that um, creating a space that people are comfortable being in and staying in. And look, let's be realistic. There was always quiet drug trade in the commons. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we all know that. The degree of loudness can be adjusted clearly. In the past, it was quieter, but right while people are smoking a lot more on the commons and such it's also now legal and taking that that trade the trade in marijuana above board i think is really good for all of us although the state could have done a way better job in their process there we're not going to get into that um in short i think that the answer to our public spaces is better community building right I agree completely with Pat that we need to be getting the county, building a better relationship with the county, getting more mental health work, supporting our community better. But I think a huge part of that is actively working internally to build community. 
the reimagining public safety program that's kind of been put on hold. Um, I'd really, there's some things involved with that, which are ex essentially one of the ideas was having co-respondents uh, that work with the police force. I would love to see that rolled out as well as another um, method for intervening in places like the commons or the parks. I mean, I also, I've also worked at the DeWitt Mall for a long time in various capacities, and we've had, we have a lot of complications with people for a variety of reasons, and, and we really would like not to call the police if it's not entirely necessary. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about reimagining, I, like, that would be a fantastic use of the five unarmed responders that we're currently planning on adding in mm -hmm. reimagining. That's also going to take some time, and we need mm -hmm. something That's in true. the stopgap, right? The the reimagining plan is going to take us at least a year post having a city manager to get right. on the ground, probably more like two. I, I wish I could say, yeah, I'm going to snap my fingers and reimagining public safety is going to happen. Uh, people have said that before. It hasn't. I'm being realistic. <laughs>